Hello, welcome back to Animated Literacy. This is part 17 of the overview and research for the program. In this section, what we're going to be talking about is automaticity and where it comes from and how it takes place in the brain. You've heard automaticity mentioned numerous times and most of the researchers today tell us that automaticity in word recognition is the number one thing that is missing from most of our struggling readers, whether they're young children or whether they're adults. So we're going to take a look at the scientific basis of where automaticity comes from and how it functions within the brain. To do that, we're going to take a look at memory. Eric Kandel is a Nobel Prize memory researcher who studied me memory at the molecular level. And what he tells us is that in addition to conscious memory, there is an unconscious memory system. What we think of as of conscious memory, we now call explicit memory. It is the recall of people, places, objects, facts, and events. And we've, what we've talked about in the past is if you are going to remember something and you're going to understand it well, what you have to ask yourself consciously is, who are the people in the text that, I, that are like the people that I know? Where are the places that I've been that is like the setting of the story? What are the objects I'm familiar with that are also in the story? What are the facts I know? And what are the events of my life that are similar to those in the story? So this all has to take place at a conscious level. You have to think about it in order to be able to do it. Eric Kandel tells us that unconscious memory is recalled directly through performance without any conscious awareness that you are drawing on memory. And he also tells us that many of these memories start out in the conscious memory system, but through constant repetition, especially repetition that engages the muscles, they can be transformed from conscious memory or explicit memory into unconscious or implicit memory. So what we're, what we're going to do now is we talked with Robert Sylvester about how narrative helps us to understand and remember information. So we're going to take a look at the factual narrative of how unconscious memory was discovered. Up until the 1970s, even scientists had not accepted that, that an unconscious memory system even existed. And when you look at most of our reading programs, they were developed in the 1970s or before. And I believe if we have a, an understanding of how the unconscious memory system works, we can eliminate all of these arguments and reading wars that we've had over whether or not children should be taught phonics and how good readers go about recognizing words. So going back in time, in um, the book by Eric Kandel, he recommends this book to go back into the history of where the discovery of the unconscious memory system came from. This is a book called Memory's Ghost by Philip Hiltz, and he spent 10 years researching and writing this book. And he tells us that the renaissance in memory science could be said to start from Mr. M. He has become a, fav a famous patient in psychology and is counted as the most studied in the history of medical science. So it was through the, um, some unfortunate events with a character who now we know his full name because he's passed away. They could not release his name until he had passed. And his name was Henry Mollison. And so to kind of take you through a little bit of his life, that is how we discovered the unconscious memory system. He was born in 1926. Um, he was a normal child until about 1933 when he was involved in a bike accident and he hit his head on the pavement. No one knew at the time of the accident that there was any brain damage that had occurred. Then in 1942, on his way in the car to his 16th birthday, he had a full epileptic seizure. He lost muscle control, he lost body function control, he flailed. And back at that time, no one knew what epilepsy was. So they thought he was crazy. They said, you're going to spend your life in a, a mental institute. You've become possessed. His, his blackouts got more and more frequent until by 1953, he was having 10 minor blackouts and one full-on seizure per week. Now, a Dr. Penfield up in Canada had developed a surgery that was successful with some patients where he would go into the brain and he would remove all or part of the hippocampus deep down in the brain from either one side of the brain or the other. 
And after the surgery, many patients were, had reduced or eliminated their epilepsy and still could function well. So he taught this surgery to a Dr. William Scoville. And Dr. William Scoville ended up operating on Henry. And when he operated on him, you have to be awake during this surgery because they have to keep probing your brain to check to see if I touch this area of the brain with, elect with an electrical probe to um, stop it from functioning, are you still able to talk and communicate? And if you aren't, then they won't remove that part. So it's a rather lengthy process. So when Dr. Scoville went into Henry's brain, what he found was that there was epileptic involvement in both hemispheres. Dr. Penfield had never operated on both hemispheres. He only one or the other. Well, William Scoville had to make an instant decision with Henry on the operating table. Do I stop or do I operate in both hemispheres? Well, he decided he would continue his operation and remove the hippocampus from both hemispheres. And up to this point, no one knew what the function of the hippocampus was. Well, because what Henry was awake, he knew immediately what he had caused to happen. Henry still retained his memory for people, places, objects, facts, and events that he knew prior to the surgery. He still had his working memory, but your working memory, we'll talk about in a few minutes, is really short. It's now called chalkboard memory. Because as soon as something new enters your working memory, everything that was there disappears. If you're going to remember it, then the working memory has to transfer to what's termed long-term memory. And this is what Henry was not capable of doing. He could not store his memories. He could not transfer them from the working memory to the long-term memory. So if he had met you prior to the surgery, he would know who you were. If he met you after the surgery, as soon as he met someone else or his brain shift to a diff shifted to a different task, then he would forget who you were. Dr. Penfield sent Brenda Milner to work with Henry and after the surgery, and she began doing various experiments with him. And this is the experiment that revealed the existence of an unconscious memory system. Henry was asked to trace a five-pointed star. And you, as you can see here, there was one star inside another star. And so he was to try to not go outside the lines as he traced that star. But he wasn't allowed to look at the star while he was tracing it. Instead, as you see in this picture, he had to look at the star in a mirror and try to trace it. So you can imagine that's a pretty difficult task. So the first time he did this experiment, he went outside the lines a lot. And they would score the experiment based on how many times you go outside the lines. So the first time, he wasn't very good at it. So now they later bring him back into the room on a different day. And they say, Henry, do, have you ever met me? No, I don't know who you are. Have you ever been in this room before? No, I've never been here before. Do you remember tracing this star before? No, I don't think I've ever done that. But when he went to tracing the star, he was much better at it, and he went out of the lines many fewer times. And every time this experiment was repeated, Henry got better and better and better at it at a normal rate. So even though he didn't remember having done the activity before, his muscle re muscles remembered, and he got better at it. So that's why many times they call it muscle memory. This is another book about Henry that was written by the grandson of Dr. William Scoville that actually performed the operation. And it gives a lot more um, information in terms of who the doctor was and what this process was. And so if you want to know more about it, that's also a really good book to read. Now, as we look at these two memory systems, this is a, a book that came out in 2009 called The Talent Code, and it's by Daniel Coyle. And he talks about these two memory systems. <coughs> Excuse me. What he tells us is that the unconscious mind is almost limit, uh, limitless in what it can do. It can process 11 million pieces of information per second. So you can imagine 11 million per second. That's huge. I don't even know how you visualize that. The unconscious mind, however, can only manage a mere 40. So what we know about the conscious mind is it's very limited in how much information it can process per second. It's also very limited in how, what kind of information it can process. The conscious mind can only do one task at a time. Now we've talked about with 
research from Keith Stanovich that there's two primary things that you have to do in order to be able to read. You have to be able to recognize the words and you have to be able to com comprehend the words. Now our conscious mind can't do two, two things at once. So it's a pretty ingenious system that we have. The conscious mind takes care of the comprehension while the unconscious mind is taking care of word recognition in a good reader. So to give you just a little bit more information on how this functions, this is a picture over here of a neuron, and then there's an axum coming out from the neuron, and the axum is like a bundle of wires. And when the neuron fires, it sends an electrical signal down that bundle of wires. Now that bundle of wires is in some ways similar to the wiring in your house. You have copper wiring that goes out of your fuse box or your um, electrical center and it sends information to the switches and the receptacles all around your house. And if that wire has a coating around it or an insulation, then that information travels efficiently. But if there's a break in that coating and two wires touch each other, then there's a spark and the lighting goes out in the house. Well, it turns out that that's a similar process that takes in place in your brain. So in order for information to travel down that axon and do it efficiently, the axon has to have a coating or an insulation around it. And the coating that goes around it is called myelin. Now, when you look over here, you can see it's kind of a sausage type thing where it wraps around and around. Now, we've known for a long time that there's a, a developmental timetable to wrapping various circuits within the brain. Some get wrapped when you're young and some get wrapped when you're older. It wasn't noted until the late 2000s that there's also another way of wrapping those circuits within the brain. And we didn't have the technology to look at white matter in a living brain until around 2005. And it's the white matter that represents the myelin that wraps the circuit. So what we now know is that when you perform a task, especially one that engages your muscles, and you do that task the same way with the same muscle movements over and over and over again, each time that task is repeated, a signal is sent to the brain that says, wrap that circuit that's involved in that activity in myelin. Now the brain doesn't care. Um, what activity it is that you're doing. It just cares that you repeat that activity. Here's a picture of what happens with multiple sclerosis. When you look at this axon, you can see that the myelin is, has been largely destroyed. So this is very unhealthy myelin and this would be a healthy um, circuit within the brain where it's wrapped efficiently. They tell us in Scientific American in 2015 that myelinated axons transmit signals up to a hundred times faster than unmyelinated ones. Myelination also accelerates the brain's information processing by helping axons recover quickly after they fire so that they're ready to send another signal. In Robert Sylvester's book, Celebration of Neurons, he tells us that what we've done over eons of time is to adapt the automatic neural machinery designed for running down food and escaping from predators to such contemporary activities as speaking, driving cars, and playing piano passages. So you can imagine if we go back to animals and, and cavemen and they're either running down a predator to, for food or they're running away from a predator to save themselves. Um, they can't really stop and think about that. It has to be an automatic process. So the brain has developed this automatic process in terms of being able to do that. Now in modern society, due to neuroplasticity that we've talked about, we can take old circuits in the brain and adapt them to new functions. So that machinery that once was used for escaping or running down predators is now used for things like driving cars, playing piano passages, and speaking. And because we use the same brain structures for reading as we use for speaking, you can say that it's also used for speaking. Now, as I mentioned before, Keith Stanovich talks about that there are two primary things that you have to be able to do to read well. Recognize words and comprehend words. 
So it's a pretty great system that your conscious mind is focused on who are the people, places, objects, and, and facts and events that I know, and how do they relate to the story. And so while the conscious mind is taking on that function, in a good reader, the unconscious mind is doing the phonological awareness and the phonics. They're looking at the letters, translating them to sounds, blending them so those sounds together, and it has to take place in hundreds of a second with no conscious thought, so that as soon as you recognize the word, the conscious center is processing the meaning of that word. You can think of this a lot like learning to ride a bicycle because you're using the same functions and I can remember really well when I was teaching our daughter how to ride a bicycle. Um, it wasn't automatic at all yet so I held onto the seat and I held onto the handlebars and I ran beside her as she was trying to pedal and trying to hold onto the steering wheel and, and trying to balance and doing all of these individual things. And so at first I had to hold onto that bike and really control it so that she could think about all these other functions. Well as she got practicing it more and more and more all of a sudden one day the bike took off faster than I could run and I had to simply watch her. And as I watched her, I began to panic because we had not yet talked about stopping. And then I found this poem that kind of puts it into a nice context. Sunday, I got a brand new bike. Monday, I learned how to ride. Tuesday, I went by my grandmother's house and to the countryside. Wednesday, I paddled up a hill. Thursday, I reached the top. I'll be home Friday or Saturday or as soon as I learn how to stop. And our daughter still remembers very well how she stopped. She said, yeah, she's riding that bike. And all of a sudden she panicked because she had no idea how to brake. And she ran into a pole, which stopped her. Fortunately, she wasn't hurt well, hurt very much. Um, but after that, she was ready to learn about how to brake. This is a quote from brain matters from Patricia Wolf that puts this into context. She says, most of the time you are able to comprehend what you are reading because the decoding process is automatic. So automaticity tells us it's happening in which memory system? In our automatic unconscious memory system that that reading specialists didn't know about when most of our reading programs were developed. So many of those reading programs are using conscious methods of word recognition, like look at the picture, skip the word and read to the end of the sentence, um, look at the beginning sound and try to guess based on context. So all of those methods were developed, as I say, before we knew about this conscious system. Now we know that unconsciously a good reader is, as I said earlier, um, looking at letters, translating them into sounds, blending those sounds together, and then the conscious memory system clicks in to say, did I pronounce the word right, or is there a word stored in my listening vocabulary that I can use to adjust it, and is there a multiple meaning for that word, as we talked about earlier. So what your unconscious does is by blending the sounds, then it triggers the conscious memory to comprehend the word and put it into context. She tells us that first grade students who are still consciously sounding out most of the words in their sentence will have a difficult time comprehending what they're reading. That's because their con conscious memory has been used up by sounding out words and now it's not available to them to comprehend. And this is why, as I may have mentioned earlier, poor readers tend to read a phrase that does not make sense and tell you it, that it does make sense because they're not processing the meaning, they're only processing the sounds and word recognition. Whereas a good reader can take something like this, and I've been to a number of workshops back, especially in the 1990s, where presenters got up and said, I haven't sounded out a word for 20 years. Good readers don't sound out words. Good readers skip words. And so they were recommending the use of context. And as I sat in their audience, I always wanted to hand them this famous poem by Lewis Carroll from Through the Looking Glass from Alice in Wonderland and see if they can read it because there's no way you can read this by skipping words, reading to the end of the sentence, memorizing words because it, they're all invented words. It reads like this. "'Twas brillig in the slithy toes, did gyre and jimble in the wave. All mimsy were the borogroves, and the moam raths outgrave." Our daughter was in a play 
when she was in middle school where she sang it. Twas brillig in the slithy toves, did gyre and jimble in the wabe. All mimsy were the boar groves, and the moan raths out grave. Now that's pretty horrible singing, but you get the idea of how the melody and the rhythm goes with this. And if you were not processing letters and sounds and blending, you couldn't read that. Now just a little bit about working memory. Henry, who we talked about where the discovery of unconscious memory came from, after the surgery he still had his working memory, he had his sense of humor, his IQ was intact, he could carry on a conversation. What he couldn't do was transfer information from his working memory to his unconscious memory. I got to go to a workshop with Stuart Zola years ago when he was at UCSD in San Diego and he was a memory researcher. And he explained your memory, your working memory this way. He says, we now call it chalkboard memory because people misunderstood the length of it. And in these two movies, they used the concept of working memory versus long-term memory, but they said, oh, your working memory, you can hold it there for during the day, but then it goes away when you sleep. Well, it's much shorter than that. Here's how Stuart Zola explained it. Back before there were cell phones, you might ask someone for a phone number, but then you would have to walk from where they told you the phone number to the physical telephone to dial the number. Now, what you would do is they would tell you the phone number and you would rehearse it along the way. So you'd keep saying it to yourself over and over and over again so that you could hold it in your working memory and dial it. Now that would work perfectly well unless someone comes up and says, hello, as you're on your way to the telephone. Well, because it's called chalkboard memory now, as soon as that person interrupts your practice or your rehearsal of that number by saying hello, now that number has been erased. If when you get to the telephone, you can still dial the number, it's no longer in your working memory, it's been transferred to your long-term memory. But of course, you could still forget it during the course of the day. So whether you hold it for five minutes or for two hours or for the rest of your life, it's now been you been transferred into your long-term memory. So now here's what happens to a child when they're reading. If they are unconsciously sounding out a word, then they can recognize that word within hundreds of a second, and then your conscious memory can start to work on the meaning of that word. But if you're not automatic yet, the child will use up their working memory trying to figure out a single word. Now, as soon as they go to the next word, because that word is now in their chalkboard memory, they forget the previous word. So now they sound out or decode the second word in the sentence. And while they're decoding the second word, they've lost the first word. And now they move to the third word. And when they're working on the third word, they've lost the first two. So there's no possible way they can construct meaning while they're going on with that process. Now, some readers like me being a, a poor reader and not having good work, word recognition skills when I was young and being dyslexic. That happened to me all the time. Well, the way I had to overcome it was by rereading. So I might go through this process for one sentence two, three, or four times, rereading that sentence and rereading it. Now I finally can hold that sentence and transfer it to my working memory, and now I can start to work on comprehension. But then I come to the next sentence, and I've got to go through that entire process all over again of rereading and rereading and rereading so that then I can shift over from my unconscious, from my sounding out words in my conscious memory to comprehending in my conscious memory. So this is something that explains why it is we have to keep doing these activities over and over. A frequent question I'm asked at workshops is, what's the difference between using animated literacy in kindergarten and first grade and in second grade? Well, in the earlier grades when it's first introduced, you're teaching children how to decode and how to link um, sounds to letters, how to blend those sounds, and they may, come, may become very good at it, but it's very fragile because the brain prunes out what it stops doing. So if you continue to do this over and over and over again, eventually it will make its way into the unconscious memory. But if you have children leaving my classroom and it's still in the conscious memory and it's not reinforced the next year, it's gonna get pruned out. At a school that I taught in for 10 years, the, it was a K-5 school and the fifth grade teachers were the 
biggest advocates of animated literacy because they said not only can I tell which of my fifth graders got animated literacy in the primary grades but I can tell how many years they got it because the kids who had it for multiple years were not afraid of anything they kept it long enough that that information got transferred to their unconscious memory and they no longer have to think about it and now they can read with fluency and comprehend the text that the teacher is giving them in order to be able to learn new information. But the child who never got it or the child who didn't hold, do it long enough may have had it pruned out and now they're still struggling when they get to the upper grades. So once again, it's critical for word recognition that we teach phonological awareness, not just to the point that children can be tested on it and demonstrate that they have it, but we have to keep doing it year after year, day after day, month after month, until it becomes an automatic activity. And that means it's gonna to have to be reinforced, not just in the, in the first, in the earliest grades, but ideally in later grades as well. So thank you again for joining me and I look forward to seeing you in the next session.